respected guest speaker honorable bala sir dignitaries on and off the dais and all the student managers of shri bala ji society a very good evening to one and all i prakar vats on behalf of bala ji institute of international business feel highly privileged to welcome and introduce mr jagdish acharya chief executive officer ppg asian paints limited so has a bachelor degree in economics and statistics from mumbai university and is a post graduate in management from iim kolkata sir was the recipient of glaxo gold medal in marketing sir has a third <laughs> sir has a 35 years of experience in paint industry and joined asian paints in 1979 and has worked in various capacities beginning his career as a branch executive in agra so moved on to international division in 1985 and became chief executive of asian paint subsidiaries in south pacific and australia in 1996 sir returned back to india after 25 years and took over ceo of asian paint joint venture with ppg during the course of the year with asian paints sir was involved in establishment of many manufacturing centers in the south pacific and in various mergers divestments and acquisitions now i would request sir to enlighten us with his words of wisdom thank you first of all i want to thank all of you from the bottom of my heart for a overwhelming welcome thank you sir there are times in your life when you feel that you're getting more than you deserve this is one of those occasions in my life when i felt i was showered upon by affection and love beyond words that i could state when coming here i uh, starting from dr party to niranjan and zenia they have been extremely welcoming and i entered into a building which is the product of an inspiration and a vision of a man it was terribly inspiring it's fantastically inspiring when you walk the corridors of your beautiful building and to address a group of this size who has been in rapt attention since morning is indeed a sight i will never never forget in my life so let's thank let's thank our fortune let's thank our providence and let's thank colonel balasubramanian No, it's all right. I think I'll make use of this. No, no, it's okay. I'll do. So let's let's talk about something that uh, is meaningful. I think to all of you. You know, many of us in management speak about theories and precepts, and we never to share with you. seldom do we share with you our experiences i think practical application of management and practical application of theories that you learn is a very important aspect of management learning what i want to try and do today is to share with you how these precepts have been used by us and how i have personally try to put in practice some of these concepts i would like it to be interactive but to interact with 
such a wonderful and a large guru may not be easy. So let us go step by step and create an engagement in which you should feel free to raise your hand and ask me a question. We speak about innovation today in a very, very positive, proactive way. Every company that you're going to meet, they're going to ask you what you know about innovation. Because in the jar full of sweet uh, chocolates, there are not any more chocolates left. To, to counter competition, you've got to bring in something new. So they say, can you think about innovation? So let's see what it is and what it means to us in our organization. Broadly speaking, innovation could be one of the two. It could be incremental innovation, which means you either optimize a process or you value engineer a product. So innovation could be either related to product or it could be related to process. There could also be something known as disruptive innovation. Now, latest management thinking is that there's nothing like a disruptive innovation. You should read that. But let, for the time being, use that word because that is common knowledge, that disruptive innovation is also in some form of an innovation. Where new market and consumers are there, something that happened to iPod when it first came, or iPad when it first was launched. It's a total replacement of and obsolescence of an existing product. So there are basically two types of innovation you speak about. There is also a lot of confusion about what is creativity and what is innovation. Now this is where I would like one of, some of you to answer my question at the end of the slide presentation. We speak about creativity. Now creativity is actually novel ideas and may not have the potential to create an impact, which is either economic, social, or perception. Even a perception and an impact which is related to perception is an impact. What are the needs? It's knowledge base is important, thinking skills are important, and intrinsic motivation is important. This is creativity. Many people confuse this with innovation. <coughs> But innovation is really an idea put into action, which generates value. You know, in the corporate life, nothing is valuable unless it creates value. Create creativity for the sake of creativity will never be acknowledged in corporate life unless it brings economic value. And it has to create an impact. Sometimes innovation also is made up of impact creation. You know, whether it's economic, social, perception, excitement, that itself can lead to the conclusion that that product or process is innovative. The needs are, there has to be a recognized need, and there is also to be a technical expertise. And more, more importantly, there has to be a risk appetite, what they call risk capital. So my friends here, you would know that the difference between Creativity and innovation is one simple word, and what is that? Yeah. Sorry? Yeah. <laughs> That's correct. Action with an impact. Action with a value. Now, when we did this, as I said, I'm going to link up all this with something that we have done in our organization. When we wanted to know whether our organization is innovative or not, First thing is, when you say that you've got to be innovative, you should know whether you are innovative or not. So what we did was, we did an exercise which said, what is the organizational propensity to innovate? What is our ability to innovate? How are we placed in terms of our ability to innovate? When you are in a, when you are in a situation of innovation, you'll find most innovative companies tolerate failures. No one gets fired due to failure, but there are consequences of failure, disapproval, PFMS. That's what happened in our organization. Our organization tolerates failure openly, but in a very 
invert a sort of invert sense it would always reflect upon your performance appraisal so we did a self analysis we said that is not tolerating failure tolerating failure should be something that comes from here saying all right you have done a good job you have worked hard your thoughts are good but it's a failed well, let's learn from this and do again something else so that is tolerating failure i wouldn't tell you how it is for my organization but obviously you can understand that it's not was not great we didn't score very high there what was our risk taking abilities now we found in our organization that the culture of experimenting was missing you know i think sometimes the pilots themselves were first launches also we were many of the people were committed to fail safe plans now that that shows that you are not having the appetite to take risks so for a company which needs to innovate risk taking ability is very important we also wanted to score ourselves on respect for individuality we realized that we did not tolerate mavericks very much in our organization you know we always wanted somebody in our own mold somebody who we felt he's like me so i am very comfortable i think in for an innovative company even mavericks have to survive mavericks have to be respected so therefore we realized that the propensity to innovate while it was there it was not very high like that i have three or more such we decided this is all practical application of innovation we said is there a respect for divergent views we found out like many organization we listen to different views expressed fearlessly but we don't take the action on those fearlessly expressed views our ability to question status quo you know we always felt that uh, the upbringing was culture of allegiance you know if if this is happening let's continue doing it now i feel for an innovative company leaders must seek divergence leaders must ask the question why this why not this this way we also found that sometimes our leadership was lacking in inspirational dialogues it was mostly operational so you know what is important here is that we need to understand before we talk about innovation whether we have the ability to innovate whether our propensity to innovate is high or not we also asked ourselves the question are we innovative what have we done well in the area of incremental innovations disruptive innovations and impactful forays and what we have not done well as leaders and as per our potential so we 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 did this analysis and we found that there are a lot of areas where we needed to bring a cultural and a mind shift and that is what we are doing as a part of our company's uh, activities in building up a pillar which is known as innovation you can be innovative and impactful if you can change your behavior to improve your creative impact now this is a loaded statement but i'll give you some interesting examples and i have to borrow these examples though they are western because of the very important points that they make steve jobs was not happy with the fan that was inside the the laptop he said that generated too much of heat and it was a very bulky fan so through his networking skills and ability of connections which he had he found out there was an engineer who was good at electrical engineering so he challenged him he said can you give me a fan which can deliver less heat obviously through a way mechanism by which the delivery of electricity was made he was able to change it <clears throat> and he was pushed to giving him a fan of a lesser size and having less heat generating less heat so what is important here is the ability to change your behavior to improve your creative impact was influenced by steve jobs's uh, persistence on this change there was also this nature of observation you know 
uh, it is very interesting that the mouse and the drop downs were not first invented by Steve Jobs or Mac. He had gone to a Xerox facility at the Pablo Center in US and found that as they were presenting him the, uh, the company information, they used some drop down menus. Of course, it was very, very bulky and not uh, elegant at all. So he said, look, why not modify this and use it in the way I want for the laptop. So in terms of observing, he showed some skills of observing. He showed skills of questioning. One other important thing that happened was in terms of experimenting new things. It is said that Mac today offers the best suites available in the area of printing and publishing. It didn't come all of a sudden. It has its origin in Steve Jobs' liking for calligraphy. As a dropout in the university, he went to study calligraphy and did very well. This is something he used in the Mac development of fonts and publishing. So there is a lot to learn. You know, as I mentioned, uh, in the area of innovation, you need to first understand whether you have a propensity to innovate, and then you also have to create a culture of innovation through association, observing, networking, experimenting, and so on and so forth. <coughs> I will uh, now go to something very important where I'll tell you some personal examples. Just as innovation is important, co-creation is important. You can only innovate if you co-create. So uh, my dear uh, uh, colleagues and friends, what I'll do is I'll share with you what we did in Australia, what we did in Calcutta to start with, in Australia uh, as a part of co-creation, which borders on doing something innovative, doing something that is impactful. I wanted to take the live examples because when you go out and do your, start your corporate careers, I think you have to understand that sometimes academic discipline are only enablers. They only enable you to do things. At the end of the day, you need to find your own examples of success. Basically, what co-creation is all about is there has to be, at the root cause, a commitment, transparency, understanding between co-creators. There have to be sensitivity. You need to understand that to give, you have to take, uh, give, you have to, uh, to get, you have to give. And you have to have futuristic approach to solutions. And you, there is no solution, there is no substitute for hard work and determination. We must also have a planned timeline because corporates cannot afford to have, you know, loose timelines. We must also understand what the constraints are so that there is a realistic view of how to progress in co-creation. We must understand what the assumptions are. We must have the right project information. We must set our goals and objective, objectives very clearly. And we must also know what are the key success factors which will enable us to reach our objective and look at opportunities. And more important than all, we must have the ability to take risks. So with this background in mind, I had a situation where in Calcutta many years ago, when I was the branch manager in between 82 and 85, Asian Paints realized that they were number fifth in the marketplace. One of the reasons was, we realized was, Calcuttans never felt Asian Paint was a part of their life. And knowing, as we all know, Bengalis, they had a tremendous sense of association to something that belonged to West Bengal. So what we did was, we are always seen as outsiders. So what we did was, we, we looked at uh, uh, the, the customer. We engaged uh, you know, an agency which studied the customer uh, uh, expectations, needs, and wants. And then we developed, we had a brainstorming session and we developed some important part of action plan, which involved having a cultural engagement with Calcutans. The start of Shiromani Puraskar was sometime in 84, 85, was the beginning of our cultural engagement with Calcutta. Today, it has transformed itself into something else where we do a lot of uh, uh, engagement during Durga festivals, and it's a continuous cultural engagement. 
I'm not saying that has contributed to us becoming number one. Many other things have contributed. But it was important for us to create, along with our agencies, along with the, the people of Calcutta, a cultural connect, which has helped us in becoming insiders today in Calcutta. <laughs> but my more interesting example is something that I can tell you about Australia. I was in Australia for almost 12 years. And Asian Paints was known as Apco Coatings there. You know, when I went there, it was known as Asian Paints. And I found that the word Asian had somewhat of a derogatory meaning there. They didn't imply it to Indians. But somehow, the quality connotation of the word Asian was not very good, especially in North Queensland or north of Australia, where we were having our factory. So I, I realized that it's important to change the name without changing the identity. So Asian Paints became APCO, A-P-C-O. And I went forward to my directors with a new livery design and a bold statement of who we were. After a lot of discussion and angst, it was approved because nobody likes to change a name. But it was approved because I said, look, let's do this and let's get a toehold in Australia. Now, in Australia, there were monopolistic brands. There were three of them. They were very strong position. 80% of the market was held by three companies. And interestingly, 70% of consumers were in 20% of the land. So it was a very skewed geographical as well as market situation. I found this as an opportunity because there was an opportunity to offer some newness. As I realized that there were gaps in positioning of the products and there was scope for improvement. But imagine you are actually a, a small identity in front of this huge companies. And if you want to take that bold call, it required all the courage that was there for you at your uh, at your disposal. Now, what we did was, now this is going to be a little detailed, but you'll enjoy the presentation as you see developing into a product. This is something all of you can learn from in terms of marketing. I realized that one of the product gap was that there was a requirement for an exterior paint, which was self-priming. That means you don't need to prime it. You can go with two coats of finishing with high build, thickness. This product also required an excellent flow and leveling and low odor. It also required, I mean, these were expectations of the customer. See, at the end of the day, a good customer knowledge is the foundation of your marketing plan. Please understand, ask the right questions about a customer, and that's what we did. We said, let's see what the customer really want. What the customer, in most cases, it was the painter, they wanted were, they wanted a wet age. That means as you paint, it shouldn't dry, so that your brush can flow back again. They also wanted outside outstanding tannin block, which is nothing but ensuring that the timber, if it's used on a timber, that the oil of the timber doesn't come through the paint. They wanted a low dirt pickup, so that even if it is, there's a lot of traffic going along, the, per, the dirt pickup on the, on the surface was not so high. And there was some expectation of gloss. So now these were all determined by us when we studied the, uh, the market. Similarly, I did a similar exercise for the best interior product, where the requirement was there has to be excellent flow and leveling, there has to be washer, washability, there has to be no odor. Now, as you see, there are some technical terms used here. But just see how it gets transformed when you speak to the customer. See, this is not a customer language. This is the language your technical guys understand. This is the language you understand. This is not the language a housewife understands. So just you see how the livery design absorbs these changes and puts them on the, on the tin. Let's, let's proceed as per how it happened. So I went with these demands to the uh, to the, to the, I went to the technical people. Basically in paints, uh, my friends, it is nothing but uh, the resin is very important, which is the vehicle, and then you have pigments. So I contacted the best resin company in Australia, and that was Roman Haas, the world national, world renowned international company. I went to their technical head. I said, Steve, I want this characters, characteristics in the product. 
in the exterior one, I want this in the interior one. And he said, uh, you know, there are four points out of this which seems to be difficult when you have the it, paint is nothing but a balancing act. But I said, no, I need some improvements in some of the existing products. I need you to develop a product. Interestingly, what we also did concurrently was, and this is something you must learn and do it in your practice when you do corporate, uh, when you have your own corporate careers. Please understand that the customer language is different from the language you and I speak in the company. For example, what we did was, we said if it's self-priming, we used a simple statement in the label which said single product application. If it is high build film thickness, we said two coat finish. If it was excellent flow and leveling, we said easy to apply. Excellent wet edge, we said more working time. Low VOC, we said sensitive to allergies. Proven exterior durability, we said it lasts for 12 years. Outstanding tannin block, we said it holds, it's, uh, it holds back timber bleed. Excellent opacity, it can hide, it's, it's very good hiding power, so on and so forth. So you can understand from a technical language, you express it in terms of consumer language. Similarly, for interior, we use a similar consumer language. You know, if it was a two coat finish, we said more leisure time. Note the change in the words we use. We said more leisure time. Excellent flows, easy to apply. The same, some of the things remain the same. For ultra smooth finish, we said superior feel and appearance. It was all talking the, the language of the customer. And then most importantly, what we decided was, how do we communicate this to the customer in a manner that is appealing? So we scanned the environment for communication. And we found that in most communication, there is always this, uh, there is always this interesting blend of East meeting West. And I'll tell you how it works. This was more for designing of our labels. If you look at this ad, you know, this ad actually is got a little bit of East in it. It's a fusion, actually, in modern uh, uh, global living. You know, there is this uh, Japanese nature along with the pathway, uh, with a very modern design of the pathway. Why? Because the West is looking for answers to the East for a better life. You know, if you look at yoga and so on and so forth, there's always this. So when we scanned the environment, we realized that if you want to make it very attractive, you've got to bring the East and West blend. There were many such uh, cutouts, you know, which we saw so that we could develop our ad campaign. See, inside out, there's a lifestyle. Uh, you'll find that uh, uh, food was there, but, you know, there was also the balance of, uh, you know, curries and chopsticks, which are Eastern flavors, decorating, you'll see the design, which were typically oriental, whereas the style is quite Western or Occidental. Similarly here, you know, if there is a meditation, the design structure is quite Western, but what you're really talking about is way, way, yoga or uh, meditation. So we did find that while the West was influencing the East, East was also influencing the West in its design. Even the fashion trends we saw, you know, there were a mix of East and West. And you see this happening over and over again. You'll find the trend of advertising quite depicting what the customer really wants, customer of these segments really want. So like that, when we studied this, we found out that East is meeting the West like never before in history. So this gave us a background to create a new label for our product. Again, I'm just showing you some more. This was concept inspiration where you have a lot of uh, design which has got a beautiful blend of ethnicity as well as modernity. Again, you can see here, there's a blend of ethnicity with modernity. So once we did this, we said, look, let's make our label, which is also got East and West meeting together. Here, the bamboos clearly is an oriental expression. And bamboo stands for long durability, solid structures, so, and also the, the design part looked quite elegant and modern. This is how we labeled our exterior product. Similarly, in the inside product, we did it with orchids. Orchids, again, are a beautiful symbol of oriental uh, uh, na nature. 
and we created that with a little bit of element, uh, elegant modern design. Now with this label, what I did was, we, did, we went to the technologists and said, this is the product. This is how it should look. It will look. And what you're going to put inside is going to sell like this. So it was some kind of a reverse innovation. You know, we, we first made how the product will look and then said to the technical guys, please put the right product inside. So my friends, it was a very interesting exercise and we ended up with a lot of good tests and successful tests. At the end of the day, we had a product which had a, a beautiful buy me label, uh, which had superior product characteristics. We did a niche marketing. We promoted it to specifier segment, and we, of course, blended the East meets West concept. We didn't stop at that. We did some extra feng shui color collections. Feng shui, as they say in Chinese, is, is like our vastu. So we also did some good color concepts with, that, with those, you know, uh, and uh, ensured that uh, I'll just show you some of those. Uh, We called it the luck collection. I'm sorry, I just I missed that mouse here. Sorry, we, we called it the luck collection. We had a lot of series of shades which went into it, so it was an addition to what already we had. Okay, we use feng shui quite a lot. You know, there were earth colors, you know, there, there are so, so many different colors. I'm not, I'm not going to go through this entirely, but we also brought in a, a new boutique collection of 30 truly beautiful decorator shades, a minimized collection to, it makes it easier for making color scheme choices. And we broadly segregated them to five, you know, like wood, bottom, metal, earth, and fire. Again, a feng shui concept. So you can imagine, you know, from just a, a small uh, product, uh, just an inconsequential product of paint inside a home, we made it something that people would take uh, time to decide upon and get involved in decorating their house. We also explained where are the appropriate places in the house where these colors could go in. And we provided shade cards, tools, which will help people to make these decisions on where it should go, which wall it should be there. These were in, I'm talking about in 97, 98, we did it. So it was fairly, uh, uh, you know, at that time, quite modern. So these were some of our uh, campaigning, you know, how we campaigned it over a period of time. At the end of the day, what is important is we found a solution together, along with the technologists, along with the marketeers, and what did happen at the end of the day, only if it makes an impact, it was worthwhile? The answer was yes. We sold quite a lot of these uh, paints in Fang the, the, the Fortuna Silk and the Villa Sun Fast extremely well in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, we were not market leaders, certainly not, because they were all uh, huge uh, companies. But we made right dents into their segments and today we are operating as an important company in Australia. The, the other thing I had in mind was something similar. You know, we all tend to um, misunderstand the cooperation we can have with vendors. So when you begin your corporate careers, treat customers is the same way you treat vendors. Or treat vendors the same way you, you treat customers. And of course, you must also treat your employees well. We found a team of four of us, the manufacturer of paint, that is us, manufacturer of resin, which is Roman has, manufacturer of glass beads, which was potters, and manufacturers of Mexicons, which was the way Mexicons are 1,000 liter or 500 KL boxes, which transfer paints. The four of us got together, and uh, in, this is in Australia, we went to each line marking, each municipal corporates, and started explaining how four of us can bring together a road marking which can dry in three minutes, if you mark the road, 
and which can actually reflect back during the rainy days when the, it's raining. I don't see anything of like that in India because the Indian applicators have their own, uh, uh, you know, their own agenda, and they, there's a there's a big uh, lobby. Very difficult to uh, get into that. But if these road marking can come to India, uh, you'll find less and less accidents because as you go, you can see the the reflection of the light. Uh, also, you can see even if it is raining. So the four four of us got together for four years. We constantly trained the line marking uh, applicators and the municipal corporators to using our power product. I'm happy to say that we were number one in North Queensland, and we still are number one. This is how it looks. Uh, these are water-based. These are water-based paints. Very interesting. You know, they evap they dry due to uh, release of ammonia. It's a wonderful, interesting chemical thing. And the glass beads are embedded in it. The retro reflectivity is very high. That means when the light hits the glass bead, you can see it back. So even in the rainy uh, days, you can see the line very clearly guiding you. But this is what they had to do. We asked the line markers to change their trucks so that line marking becomes easy. This, as you see here, the, that maxicon there is actually where 1000 KL is put in. So you can imagine what we all did. You know, we, we created a new paradigm here uh, where we made the paint. The Roman has gave one of the best emulsions uh, for which we had to make the paint. The potter's guys produce the right glass beads which can get embedded. And then you had the Mexican guys uh, who, are, who actually provided wonderful Mexican. The customer also got involved and said, look, I'll have a truck made so that it's easy for me to apply. This has become common practice in Australia now. This is how it is applied on the road. And this is how it looks at dark night, I mean, it's night. You can clearly see the roads, uh, the markings. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my idea of sharing this with you was to tell you that just by explaining academic co concepts or precepts, uh, I don't think a management lecture is complete. It's only when you can give examples that I think it becomes of practical value. So that was the objective. Uh, I still have five more minutes uh, before I really must thank the, the speaker uh, uh, succeeding me or uh, following me because he made time for me to come in because I have to get back to Bombay. Thank you very much. Uh, but uh, I still have five minutes. If you have any questions, I'll be very happy to answer. Um, and if you feel there's something more you want to know or you want to learn, uh, I have left my contact with Dr. Padi, and you can feel free to contact me anytime and I'll make myself available for your questions. No. I hope you found it interesting. Yes. yes sir. Okay, thank you. That was a good feedback. Anyway, you didn't have any choice, isn't it? You had to listen to me. <laughs> anyway, thank you for your comment. Yeah. Sir, I uh, need to ask one question. Yeah. Sir, what are the factors which are necessary to replace a product instead of existing product, what, whatever it is running on in market? See, you can't replace a product which is accepted by the customer. <coughs> so the factor is the customer. See, this is a, it's an interesting question. Uh, if the product is meeting customers' needs and demands, then it would be foolish for you, and it is commercially very viable, and it forms a segment which is bringing you revenue, it would not be advisable to replace it, unless you replace it with a product which offers better value in the same segment and which has got better commercial uh, uh, returns. I'll give you one example. I think that example will help you. In automotive, I look after automotive coatings company. In you may be seated. In automotive, we have what is known as when the white sheet metal comes for the car to paint, it gets pre-treated with solution. 
so that all the grease and all goes, and then it gets into what is known as an electrocoat tank. Now, electrocoat technology is very interesting. It is water-based. Uh, it gets a dip, and with the dip, it's electrically charged, so that you know it stays in all the part and the crevices, and then it goes up and gets baked. What we have done is we have replaced the old product with a new one, which offers lesser thickness, but can go into more number of parts evenly than before, and which is more expensive to the customer in the short run, but less expensive when it number of coats to be applied or the thickness that is there. Is consum consuming is less. Consumption is less. So what has happened is the customer is very happy. He is paying more, but he is consuming less. So he gets a profit there. And we are happy because we are getting more for our product. The only thing is that we will be selling him less. So there is a compromise. But we find even if you do that, at the end of the day, you are offering better value to customer. And your realization is better. So when such a thing happens, and the customer is happy, and you have not vacated that segment, then I think that's the right choice to make. Yes. Yeah, but you know, that's interesting you said, be seated. <laughs> Behind every successful man, there is also a woman who says he's wrong. <laughs> no, I, 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 I think you're right, you think you're right. See, I'll tell you, uh, and I, I, I'm very happy you brought this question because it uh, raises uh, interesting uh, dimension of uh, uh, diversity. First of all, I am very blessed that I have a wife who has been a part of my success. Uh, is that what you asked, isn't it? Yeah. Part of my success because we traveled, uh, we shift, we sh that the other day I was looking at, we have moved 20 houses in 25 years. Uh, you know, I have worked for 35 years, but abroad we have moved quite a lot. But it wouldn't have been possible if we don't have a partner who understands what it is for. Fortunately for me and uh, fortunately for our children, she devoted herself fully to the children. So it was a balance we maintained well. But there have been times when I have all, uh, always put company first before the family and I think that was a mistake I made. I don't want you all to make that mistake. Family comes first, company can always come second. There are a lot of us very ambitious, we say company comes first, let me do everything for the company. I think that's a very foolish thing. You must do what is right for the company, never do anything wrong. I worked for the company for 36 years. But somewhere, sometimes, I have put the company first and the family second. I think that could have been avoided. But because I had a very understanding partner, it still didn't matter, okay? Now, I want to come to the second part of diversity. I think, you know, there are always this thing about husband doing it and wife doing it. I think this should be equally uh, relevant in a reverse way. I think if the wife's career is good, then the husband should also be able to manage. And this is the change I would like society, in society to happen. I think if sometimes the wife's career, and all of you are ambitious, you all want a career. And if at the end of the day, if you find your career is good, and your husband's career is also good, but yours is slightly better in the sense of uh, materialistic, then I think you should have a good partner who understands it. But I think it will take a little while in our culture to let, for that to happen. So you asked a small question, I gave you a big answer. Excuse me? Yeah. Excuse me. Since we are running out of time, this will be the last question. Good evening, sir. Sir, my question is, what is the difference in choice of color between Indian and Australian customer? Uh, color? See, uh, you must like food, no? Color is also a matter of geography and temperature and, you know, it's very interesting. And color has got some cultural orientations also. 
For example, in Australia, because it is uh, winter most of the time in southern Australia, you will have darker colors and Victorian colors. In the northern part, they are very light colors because of the heat. In India, it is uh, color has got this light and dark. But sometimes, even in south, even when it is very hot, people prefer dark colors. Uh, I have never understood why uh, there has to be a garish pink or a blue or a green. But I suppose that is our culture. You know, we like uh, statements being made about our house. So uh, the color choices are different. I think in, in Australia, you'll find a color more related to the circumstance of the building. And uh, there is certainly a bias towards Victorian heritage colors, which is not there in India. Actually, India can be very colorful. Unfortunately, in paint, not the right colors come out. But you, when you walk the streets from starting from, say, Janmashtami to Ganesh Utsav and then going up to December, you'll find every month very colorful, uh, starting from Holi also. So you, every month is colorful. I, and in your saris and so many color, we will like color, we love color. But I don't know why we don't bring it to our homes. Uh, we've started doing it. Asian Paint has helped in creating some of these color choices. But we are slow in bringing color to our lives as much as probably Australians do. I think that was the last question. Thank you very much, uh, my friends. And uh, do feel free. Thank you.